is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. two or three minutes of uh, Beethoven to uh, let you clear your minds from whatever else is going on in your day. I'm David Firon. Welcome to another Duran uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Joe DeFeo. Uh, this subject uh, is something that I mentioned to Joe before, the, before we started that uh, in my career has come up again and again as such a, a practical way of sorting out from all of the uh, chaff, if you will, and finding the wheat, finding the things that are most significant and instrumental in uh, in making decisions for driving business forward or anything else forward. So I, I'm not going to steal Joe's thunder, but I will mention two things. First, we do uh, look for your questions, which you can post, uh, and uh, either through the uh, course of the conversation with Joe or at the end, we'll uh, make sure we address them. Also, there is a hand raising uh, tool here that we're going to experiment with this time. If you see it on, on your menu and you want to raise your hand, uh, Joe will probably be able to pause and, and see what, you, what you're uh, typing in as a question. Uh, or, or he'll just ask for a reaction. So anyway, here we are for the 80-20 rule, also known as the Pareto Principle. Welcome, everyone. Joe, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Firon, and welcome everyone from around the globe. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, and I could do a lot of puns with this one, but uh, I hope that this 45 minutes you spend is a vital few part of your day, not the useful many. Um, I look at the list of names today and I see some of the familiar names that have been on our webinars. And uh, these are kind of becoming fireside chats about a topic of importance to us in the performance improvement field and this one happens to be the largest turnout uh, that we've had in two years so uh, either people know a lot about it or a little about it or just love hearing me talk so thank you for all coming uh, the 80 20 rule also known as the Pareto principle or you could say the Pareto principle 
also known as the 80-20 rule. And uh, in my uh, discussion today, uh, I am hoping that I could kind of stress the importance of using the Pareto as a way to not just focus for project selection, project analysis, and project solutions, but actually kind of explain how not using the Pareto can actually cause root cause analysis to go astray. Pareto principle was actually uh, created to make it easier and faster, not longer and slower. So that's my first objective. And we'll talk also a little bit about the backstory because um, everybody believes that Wilfredo Pareto, whom it's named after, actually named the tool himself uh, it's actually not the case, uh, and our own Dr. Duran actually gets credit for that. Uh, but it's great that uh, someone who never knew he had a Pareto principle named after him uh, is so popular. Uh, the third one is we're hoping that uh, you can use the root uh, use Pareto principle, Pareto chart, Pareto diagram better in your root cause analysis or DMAIC programs, or even in daily life, as I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, and answer your questions. I'd like to see if the uh, hand raising works. Uh, we've used a number of online web services and some are easy, some are not. So can everyone find the hand raising and just wave, say hi, raise your hand? And I wanna see what that does. Okay, it doesn't do much of anything. So we'll just stick to questions. Um, so here's the question. Anytime you have a question, please send it on through. If Dave feels it's important, he'll interject. If not, we'll catch it at the end. So let's begin. Let's go a little slower. So what is the Pareto principle? Well, the Pareto Principle was a way in which Dr. Duran defined the useful many versus the vital few tasks. And he defined that as a universal principle, meaning it applied to many different things, that a relative important tasks accounted for the majority of the results. And a relative many of the useful tasks accounted for little of the results. How the Pareto principle became known as the 80-20 rule may have something to do with Dr. Durant's explanation about the Pareto principle, but we can't find anybody who takes ownership of the 80-20 rule other than the Pareto principle. Not that it's important, but in case you were wondering, the message is very important, that there are so many things to do in business today, so many things to do in life today, that you can be better off if you focus on these vital few issues, which return great investments, or spend the same amount of time on so many useful tasks, you don't get the same investment. A very typical scenario is, a relative few of your customers account for the majority of your sales. A relative few of the sales force accounts for the majority of the selling. We can also joke about it that says a relative few employees account for most of the work getting done. There are many ways that we can cut this statement of the 80-20 rule. Now, the 80-20 is not fast and furious as an 80-20. It's meant as a visual representation of the vital few versus the useful many. It's been very useful in trying to sort projects to work on or the problem to solve. And I hope as we go further, I will help you do better at both of those. Now, you can go and Google, as I do, and that's how I find my great pictures. Uh, you can type in the 80-20 rule, and you will get pictures like this. And you could talk to anybody, 
and they will always tell you about the 2080 rule because they may not agree to the 8020 rule. Uh, but the 8020 rule is simply stated the way Durant stated it in the Pareto principle. Uh, it's an easy thing to think about. It's something we can do every day. And in this graph that you see here, it's showing the difference between the Pareto and a linear significant line. Uh, if we assume that everything were linear, then we would have one way of making decisions. That means every decision could be equal to the other. But if we see things in the way Dr. Duran saw them, that a relative few account for the many, we could make bigger and less decisions and get big results. And that's the heart of what's behind 80-20. Now, I'm sure somebody out there is going to send in a note saying, I know who invented the 80-20 rule, uh, but I'm going to guess it goes back uh, to cavemen and cave people because it just made a lot of sense. And it probably took a lot of time before somebody wrote it in a book and then made money off it. Because there are many books out there on the 80-20 rule, particularly as it relates to time management. If any of you have uh, ever taken a time management uh, program, it tells you to group things in A, Bs, and Cs. And the As are very important. The Bs are lesser important, and the Cs will get to them when we have time. Now, what is the Pareto diagram? Uh, interesting, uh, if you've got software, you can make Pareto diagrams of all different types. But a Pareto diagram is a ranked bar chart with the highest or the largest number on the left side with the smallest number on the right side. It's a descending ranked bar chart. If you see it any other way, it's not a Pareto chart. A histogram or a frequency distribution would be showing you different patterns, typically grouped around the center of the chart. Uh, if you are doing a bar chart over time, you would see a bar chart over time, but it probably would not look like that. But the Pareto has two aspects to it the ranked bar chart, and the cumulative percent line. And it is designed as a visual tool, meaning when we have a lot of something, and so for instance, if we have a set of possible defects, there are 20 defects, but not all defects are equal. We could also say we have 20 spaces on a form to fill out. Not all 20 are equal, but in both cases, some errors occur more often than others. And if we were to plot the data by occurrence, we would typically see a few would account for the many. So in other words, if there were 100, let's say if there were 100 defects, 10 different types of defects, we would have 10 bars, and two or three of those defects might account for 50 or 60 or 80 of the total percent, thereby giving you the 80-20 rule. The Pareto diagram uh, will go into a little bit more, but we have the Pareto principle, vital few, useful many. The Pareto diagram that depicts the vital few and useful many. And there was a really interesting reason why Dr. Duran decided to create this diagram and not stick with the pie chart that was very popular at that time. But first, first, who is Pareto? Uh, this gentleman has some very interesting uh, background. Um, he actually was born in France, lived in Italy, moved to Germany, back to Italy. So he actually um, was Wilfred Fritz Pareto, and then when he went to Italy, uh, became known as Wilfredo Pareto. Uh, and he lived at the turn of the century, and he was an engineer, sociologist, economist, political scientist, philosopher, uh, and 
now known for the 80-20 rule, named after him as the Pareto principle. And as we'll see, uh, Dr. Dram gave him that glorious uh, principle associated with his name. Most of the contributions of Wilfredo Pareto were in economics. And if you study economics, you will see his famous income distribution. Uh, and that income distribution showed that a relative few of the population accounted for the majority of the wealth. Uh, we here in the United States have been seeing this income distribution the past few years presented all over the media because year after year, fewer and fewer people are holding more and more of the wealth. Uh, the reason why Wilfredo Pareto uh, did that study was that he was really a political scientist. And my understanding too, he was also Mussolini's cabinet member at the turn of World War I. And he used the term the elite in the social analysis that the quote vital few were really the elite that accounted for much of the wealth. And although that sounds pretty simple, uh, when you're trying to make government decisions and you believe that everyone is equal, you're going to make a bad decision. So he introduced the concept of the Pareto efficiency that became part of our microeconomics, and typically that's where you see it in class, and it followed a Pareto distribution. Uh, and this Pareto distribution is what gets confused with the Pareto principle and Pareto diagram. Um, the Pareto principle was named after him because Dr. Duran always gave credit where that credit was due. And because he did not invent it, uh, he just popularized it and created a diagram. He felt that it should be called the Pareto principle. So there you have Wilfredo Pareto. Now, how does Dr. Durand fit in? And how does the Pareto, Pareto principle uh, get associated with Dr. Duran and uh, Wilfredo Pareto. There was a very famous paper uh, called, as you see here, Mia Culpa, meaning it was on my head. Uh, and in this paper, which was published in 1975, um, the non-Pareto principle Mia Culpa um, Explain the story behind naming the Pareto Principle. Uh, it's in the short term, uh, it was that he saw a graph about salaries that Pareto, Wilfredo Pareto had done on the distribution of wealth. He found that that graph looked very similar to what he saw while working in the 1920s in the Hawthorne Works factory of Western Electric with regard to defects. And they looked so similar that he decided that a lot of graphs looked like Pareto's graph. So he jotted down the idea and decided to call it the Pareto principle and just put it off to the side. And in, doctors, in Dr. Duran's own words, uh, I think it's worthy to, to hear them. As part of that visit, I was shown research that was conducted relative to the work of Wilfredo Pareto, an Italian engineer and economist. Pareto had studied the distribution of wealth. He had found that a relative few families had acquired most of the wealth, while the many remaining families had very little, which was no surprise there. Pareto went a step further, fighting, uh, fitting a logarithmic curve to the data. This took place while he was at GM. The GM researcher then found that the distribution of General Motors salaries also followed the logarithmic distribution. The research was interesting, but I doubted that our Western Electric managers would make any application of the findings. But it was my first exposure to Pareto's work. I filed it away in memory. 
Later, within a decade, I published an important discovery. The phenomenon of vital few and trivial many extended far beyond the distribution of human wealth. It was present everywhere. A relative few people committed most of the crimes, caused most of the accidents, and so on. I gave the name Pareto Principle to that discovery. In due course, the Pareto Principle became a widely used management tool, a universal. In addition, the Pareto Principle became a part of the management vocabulary. So Dr. Duran was a very um, shy kind of person, but also gave credit where it was due. And then, and then in his autobiography, he takes it one step first, further. I was forced to confess that I had mistakenly applied the wrong name to the principal. The confession changed nothing. The name Pareto principle has continued in force and seems destined to become a permanent label for the phenomena. In other words, he should have called it Duran principle, uh, but it will stay as forever the Pareto principle. We like to call it Duran's Pareto principle. And so the most we can see is that Wilfredo Pareto uh, planted a seed. Dr. Duran put water on it. And here we have the Pareto principle, the Pareto diagram today. Uh, what's interesting is that Dr. Duran actually did create the Pareto diagram to make things much easier. Now, I mentioned about a pie chart. Now, for those of you who know the Pareto, why would you even use a Pareto if you have a pie chart? And I'd love to ask you that question and see some of your answers. So if anybody would like to give the answer, why would you use a Pareto when the pie chart was available? As a matter of fact, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, we, don't, we didn't have software, so we had to do these things by hand. Um, and both are pretty easy, circles or, or rectangles. But today we have software that does it very quickly. And if anybody has a response, I'll be happy to uh, give your response before mine. And, and Mike both have responses. Go ahead, Dave, read them. Pareto distribution is more visually understood. Pie charts don't rank or display cumulative sum percent. Michael. Very, very good answer, Michael. Yeah. And now that might sound like a really good reason, which is, I mean, you can see, you know, you can add these up if they're relative simple, four or five pieces of the pie. Um, but there's one interesting thing about Dr. Duran. He was colorblind. And Dr. Duran found that if you had a pie chart with many parts, the only way you could distinguish the parts was by changing the shade or changing the color and made it very, very difficult to discern the colors. He also found that people wanted to distort the colors in the pie so that you could visually see one color or one piece of the pie over the other. For instance, if you can see bright colors you tend to see the red first. When you draw your attention to the red, you may be drawing your attention away from the vital few versus the useful many, as in the case in both of these. The largest piece of each of these pies is blue or dark blue. Uh, the, on the left, the circle, is second one is a lime green and the red is third. On the right, the red is second. Now, what's important here is that the pie chart is also supposed to be a visible tool. But with the pie chart, you can distort the person's view by changing the color. And as Michael said, it doesn't really tell you the percent of the total. So we had to come up with a better way, and that's where Dr. Duran decided that 
the Pareto was a better way to do it. And I will get into that better way. Oh, let me uh, let me jump one slide. So when you look at the Pareto diagram, it the height of the bar and the point at which the cumulative line changes is what should draw your attention, not the colors. And I do a lot of project reviews of six sigma like and root cause analysis projects, and I enforce over and over again if you use a pie chart i don't necessarily trust your picture because the colors distort my view if you use a pareto it's very hard to distort one's view so how and where do we use the pareto principle well first of all uh, in process improvement we use it in project selection why because there are many problems that need to be fixed or many opportunities that need to be tackled in organizations that you belong to. And you need some way to distinguish between the vital few and the useful many. Now, what constitutes a vital few would be based on the criteria you establish. So we might establish a great, the vital few might be those that rank high that is going to impact customer experience those that rank high on reducing a defect, those that rank high on improving safety. So that when we rank the projects, those are going to come up as larger, better, vital few opportunities. Another way to do it, which is what Dr. Duran espoused, was calculating the cost of poor quality that resulted because the problem existed. And that cost of poor quality then could be used as a comparison for the vital few or the useful many. And the reason being, if there is a universal phenomena for defects and for wealth, there's also a universal phenomena for return on investment, meaning a relative few projects should give a great return. Uh, that is why black belt projects go after larger scale projects than green belt and yellow belt if you're doing Six Sigma because the belief is that a black belt project is tackling something that is much bigger, it's going to take us longer and needs more analysis. Now that's not always the case because we have seen very simple root cause analysis activities in a day or even a couple hours uh, identify major improvements because they found that root cause very quickly. I'll give you one specific example. Uh, and this is my second bullet here, focusing on the vital few aspects of a problem. Um, you can relate this to a, another industry, but if you're a hospital and you had 10 physicians seeing patients and those patients continually be readmitted to a hospital for some follow-up ailment or poorly diagnosed or just because they got sicker, uh, that's called a readmission. And a readmission is a penalty to a hospital because a patient should not be readmitted. Uh, it's like a manufacturing defect. You know, you can't send it back and fix it. So a project team that set out to reduce readmissions spent endless amount of energy prior to the project analyzing flow, analyzing everything, except not looking at one simple piece of data. What made up readmissions. And so there are type of patients, how ill the patients were, which are the core, uh, the morbidity levels, which are uh, a numerical rating. Uh, they could look at the male versus female, the age. In other words, there's a number of ways to look at readmissions. In doing that, one of the ways showed the physicians and the amount of their patients that were readmitted. And ironically, two physicians accounted for 85% of all readmissions. At that point is when you begin to theorize, what is different about these two physicians? And if we don't figure that out, we are not going to reduce readmission rates dramatically. 
that is the aspect of the Pareto principle that is a universal concept. That when you are given a problem to solve, you first begin by measuring the defect, the failure, the loss, and put it in a way that shows that vital few versus useful many. If you're doing root cause analysis or Six Sigma using Demaic, and actually somebody typed that wrong, uh, Demaic, uh, when you're doing the M, it's the measuring phase. We define the problem in words, we measure, and, and this is where people want to do too much measuring. We're really trying to measure and understand how those words look in reality, how they look because there's a universal phenomenon behind them. If we can see the type of defect, the type of failure, the type of issue and break it down, then we can move very quickly. I always recommend that you do a Pareto before you do a flow chart, before you do a SIPOC, before you do anything. Why? Because it's usually created from the data you have. And once you have that data, it will really direct your team to the next step. The thought process is this, that if you define your problem in words, which is your project Y, and the Y is a function of X, and you then set out to measure. Well, measure doesn't just mean uh, measuring control charts, measuring voice of the customer, measuring every step in the process. At this point in time, it says measure the current defect. What is the Y? So in the case of uh, your problem or your organization, that would show you, if you collected a little bit of data, that there were 10 physicians, and those 10 physicians accounted for 100% of the readmits, but two of them accounted for a majority of that. That data was readily accessible. The question of what is, what is our measurement of our readmits, it'll tell us the type of uh, illness. Getting that data in measure then sends you down a path. Is it a process-related problem? or a problem-related problem, meaning is the process creating the defect or is it something else? And if the process is creating that defect, then we're going to do a process analysis and that will lead us down a path. If it's not in the case of the physician, we need to find out about these two physicians, what they do differently, and then maybe go to process. So using the Pareto properly, versus skipping it or doing it later for just a test of theories misses an opportunity to move very quickly. And I'm emphasizing this because many, many times people think problem solving is too slow. And it is because people do so many unintentional tasks that provide useful but not vital information in define and measure. And then they have to come back and get that later. Another aspect is when developing solutions. Not all problems have one fix. Not all fixes are equal in cost. So when developing solutions, you always have to weigh which solution is going to net us the biggest bang for its buck uh, in terms of return on investment. Now, also, there are things that you can apply to every day. Many time management programs utilize the Pareto principle when managing your time or resources. So for instance, um, managing time, I only have so many hours in a day, what tasks should I be doing? Uh, and as far as resources go, if we're trying to support projects with black belts and green belts and they're of limited resources, it would make sense that we wanna put those limited resources on the greatest return on investment we can, which are those projects that were used in project selection, which were vital few. And Duran's whole existence was based on, we have limited resources, whether those be organizational or natural, and therefore we have to make best use of them for our business and our society. Others will, otherwise we will waste them. 
Lastly, it's a time management technique that you can apply to yourself. Um, I heard a very interesting uh, way to describe the Pareto Principle using the famous Noah's Ark. Uh, if Noah built the ark properly to house all the animals that were created in one ark, it would have to be of a certain capacity to hold all that weight. And if all the animals got on the ark and it was appearing to be too heavy, what should he do? Should he eliminate thousands of birds and small pets? Or should he toss a couple of elephants? What would the Pareto Principle say? The Pareto Principle say would toss the elephants because a relative few are going to weigh a lot more than a few thousand. And that is a story that you can use as well. Now, the Pareto Principle can also say, well, if I get rid of the only two elephants I have, then we won't have any more elephants. But if I get rid of a thousand birds, we still have a few birds left. The point being, a Pareto is a management tool not one time end all in itself. You can conduct multiple Pareto's, one using cost, one using events, or in this case, we might set the criteria that no matter what weight we lose, we still have to maintain the integrity of all animals. So how do we create a Pareto diagram? Well, this is a typical form on a, not a form, but it's a spreadsheet. And so for any defect type, and I wanna use the word defect loosely. When we talk about root cause analysis, process analysis, or DMAIC, we tend to talk about Y is a function of X. And Y is the visible evidence of a failure, the visible evidence of customer dissatisfaction, the visible evidence of poor quality, the visible evidence of something. That is a defect. But those defects have various shape to them, various names for them. Those are defect types. And so what we need to do is count how many different types of errors there are for that Y and put them in order of how many, as you see in this spreadsheet. So there are A through X possible order form errors in this case. And you can see the contribution of the number of errors going down in the second column. And then if you add all those up, they total 160. And then if you divide each one of the errors by 160, you'll get its percent of the total. And then if you add each percent of the total to the next one, you'll get the cumulative percent. Now with today's software, it's pretty easy to do that. But what you want to end up with is a picture. And uh, Ellis Ott is someone I quote often, and Ellis Ott was a famous statistician who said there are only three rules for data analysis. The first rule was plot the data because the picture of the data will tell you something. The second rule was plot the data because the picture of the data will tell you something. And the third rule is plot the data. So if you're used to data that looks like this, it's only partially useful. You need to turn it into data that looks like this. Yes, data that looks like this shows there are four or five total outcomes that account for the majority, but you can see that much quicker here and much easier here. This is that same data shown here and here, and at any point on the red line, you could hover over that and get your percent. But I'm also using it to describe the elements of the Pareto diagram as Dr. Duran saw them. And this is something that teams have trouble with. So first of all, along the horizontal axis are the, in this case, the billing item number, the letter that corresponds with the type of defect. The purple bar chart, are the individual letters and the number of errors per. So one, a G had 42 and J had 39, et cetera. 
So horizontal and vertical, and vertical is always a number. The vertical should always add up to 100% of the total defects, which is about 160 in this case. Uh, there actually is a bar that goes higher than that, but it's not showing. The right side is the cumulative percent, zero to 100%. And without my vital few and useful many diagram, Looking at it, you can see that the first three or four account for the majority versus the 10 to the right. Visually, it's easy to see, and visually, uh, we can then focus on the vital few. Now, the rule of thumb is shoot for about 80%. However, the vital few really means where the cumulative line begins to flatten out. So if we had 20 items, maybe six are in the vital few. If we had 10 items, there might have only been two in the vital few. So it's supposed to be visual once again. And so that point at which the vital few begin to create less of a slope, Duran called the awkward zone. And he called it the awkward zone because it's not quite vital few and it's not quite useful. But he had a real good answer for that. Get to it after you do the vital few because it's going to be the next big one anyway. But don't do it until you've tackled the first ones. And please don't go after the useful many. We like to call those things just do it. It's okay to go just do those things. They tend to take about the same amount of time as the vital few because you still have to spend resources to go analyze and find out what's causing those things to occur. So use the vital few as a visual tool. Now, if you get a flat Pareto chart, all bars equal, the first question you have to challenge is how you created the Pareto. Because if it is a universal phenomena, just like when you're creating frequency distributions, there's normal curves and normal distribution, um, that first might signal that the data is wrong. Something is wrong in the data because universally speaking, there should be a few accounting for more. And usually when that happens, it's how we chose to put the horizontal axis, how we defined the type of defect. Let me try to give you an example. Uh, in electronic circuit board manufacturing, i uh, sorry, in a medical device, we have electronic circuit boards, we have pneumatics, we have hydraulics, we have optics. And we could identify defects part by part. And we might show there's 10 defects in each part and it comes out equal. But if we organize those defects by hydraulics, pneumatics, electronics, and mechanical, you might find that all the defects were of a mechanical type or an optical type. In other words, the choice of what we pick may be giving us that flat Pareto. So be cautious of that as you create your Pareto diagram. A Pareto diagram without the cumulative line is still okay. It's just not as okay if it has the cumulative line, only because we can easily say without much additional addition or operator mathematics can say this equals 75%, this equals 60%. So it just makes it easier. So let me summarize a little bit about the Pareto principle. There are relative few of the contributors account for the bulk in most cases. We don't do anything in absolutes anymore because with all the data analytics today, we're always finding one pattern that is different. Finding patterns that show the highest concentration of improvement potential with the fewest number of remedies and the least amount of analysis is what we're trying to do. Pareto is stratifying the data. It is a way to stratify data. Stratifying data means to break apart the data. If one way of stratifying the data does not yield vital few, 
re-stratify it by other characteristics as I just described. It is a visual method of separating a vital few from the useful many. It helps establish consensus on top priorities for management and then allows you to set a stage for action. Applied in prioritizing problems, it can help you sort the vital few. Analyzing symptoms can help you narrow down your choices quickly and identifying root causes because it allows you to test fewer than you might have tested. And it could be a useful time management tool. I realize that uh, in each of these, and I'm very excited about talking about the Pareto, that I wish we could have a real dialogue between us because I would love to know how well you see the Pareto used or not used, or how much more beneficial could you see the Pareto being used or not used. Um, my belief is that if more people understood the Pareto and applied it, we would not hear the story. We don't have enough resources to do all the things we need to do in my company. Uh, or we never seem to tackle the real big issues that need to be tackled. Those are two killers of transformation and culture change. So I'm hoping that you guys can uh, drop me a line or follow us or just reach out to us. And uh, I would like to flip this back to Dr. Firon. Are there any questions? Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, Jonathan asked one at the beginning, uh, how does the Pareto principle relate to the theory of constraints and its bottlenecks? Is this the same universal process? Um, I only, the only thing I could state there is that when you identify what the constraint is, there may be multiple types of constraints that then are put into a Pareto. They are not one versus the other. Um, the Pareto is just a way to show. Um, now, one could say, when you're thinking about theory of constraints, that a relative few areas in a process are causing that constraint that once you relieve that bottleneck, things will flow better. So in essence, you are saying the same thing. But it is typically used in a different way and not to take away from the theory of constraints or take away from the Pareto. Um, it's the same universal principle, just a different way to describe that is my best answer. I hope that helps. Thank you, Jonathan. One thing that's come through to me, Joe, as I've, I've, I've followed through uh, this presentation is uh, the genius that I think Dr. Duran and you are building into this whole realm of Duran work about not wasting uh, valuable resources. That came through. And while we talk about scrap and other forms of waste being something that we are trying to remove, I think this goes deeper. This is saying human effort uh, and everything that goes along with it. If you could just focus correctly or as close to correctly as possible, then you wouldn't be wasting all these other precious resources and particularly these days time. So could you just reinforce that uh, uh, sense of waste that you picked up from Dr. Duran and you carry forward in, in, in the rest of the Duran uh, experience going forward? Well, you know, Dr. Duran was very pragmatic and, and when I joined the company, there was a big crisis at the time and you couldn't fix everything. And he always said leaders are very busy people and they can't fix everything, but they can't delegate everything either. But what you can do is get everybody rallied around those important things that need to get done and deploy them in the goals to the workforce and the operational forces. Give the operational forces the same thinking, focus on the vital few with the fewest number of projects to get the most gain. That's what his project by project concept was. The other part of that is um, with the advent of Six Sigma and then Lean Six Sigma, and you can call it any kind of Six Sigma. I heard Agile Six Sigma recently. There's a body of knowledge that has been accumulating that has worked in one company and then gets carried over to the other company. And then that body of knowledge becomes certified to say, I know that body of knowledge. Uh, and so societies like the American Society for Quality, the European societies um, create certifications around that as we do for good reason. One, we want to demonstrate that people know 
the tools. Unfortunately, there may be too much body of knowledge embedded in the training that is covered to really understand and simplify how to solve a problem or how to complete a green belt project. And we often hear, um, there's so many tools that I have to learn to get certification. And that's a result of this body of knowledge. The question you should really ask is, what tools do I really know to solve the problem? And that is a subset of the body of knowledge. And so what we try to do and what we learn from Duran and, and others is that use the methodology the way you would solve a problem in your own home. Use it to the best of your ability. Use the tools that are needed, not nice. And over many projects, I might be able to see all the tools used. We at Duran, when we certify green belts, we don't expect to see every project with all the tools used, but we do know that every project must have a symptom theory and cause found through data analysis, which means you better show me a, a Pareto, you better show me a cause and effect diagram, and you better show me how you prove those cause and effect true. So I'm hoping that um, as, as people become more and more aware of the tool and the method, and also they have these resource constraints, they'll start thinking more about the Pareto Principle. Of which I wish it was called the No DeFeo Principle, honestly. <laughs> okay, from this day forward, I so degree. Uh, Joe, we have one other uh, uh, from Michael. Uh, Dr. DeFeo, did you observe that a relative few people commit the majority of crimes in all those movies you made with Joe Pesky? <laughs> well, I'm going to guess. Sure where that's coming. Out. I'm going to guess <laughs> that somebody out there knows who I am, and uh, they're they're responding <laughs> to the fact that I I resemble Robert De Niro to an uncanny likeness, and all I can say to you <laughs> is forget about it. <laughs> and I will see you next month if you come back. Okay, Joe, we're we're not going to forget about today nor the uh, Pareto principle. Uh, they, there will be every at the end of each month uh, another one of these webinars, and I also want to put in a plug for uh, some work that Joe's putting out on LinkedIn. I believe uh, a group that you can join where he uh, is interactive uh, throughout the week whenever we can get to a, a phone or to a, a computer. Uh, and uh, also, I'll ask you all to take a visit to the Duran webpage from time to time. It's a very dynamic organization and things that are coming up uh, new and different uh, just about every day. So again, everyone, thank you for your patience, uh, for staying with us to the end of this webinar, and we'll look forward to seeing you and anyone you want to encourage to attend uh, next month.